isn't some cheesy kid show. This is Kids in the Tank, a young perspective on business from high school students. Welcome to Kids in the Tank. I'm Jenna, and with me in the tank are Trent and Katie. Today, we are honored to have John Finch in the studio with us. John is the Vice President of Training and Recruiting at Milwaukee Tool. John, you are officially in the hot seat. Fantastic. So, we're curious, John, what's your favorite tool? Favorite tool? Uh, gotta go with an impact wrench because I can do almost anything with it. Tons of accessories, light, fast, easy to use. Sounds perfect. <laughs> we noticed that you've been with Milwaukee Tools since 2000. You started as a sales rep and climbed your way up to vice president of training and recruiting. What are some of the things you did to work your way up? And is there anything you wish you did or didn't do during that time period? To get moving forward in that career, not only did I have to do more of the job and do it really well, they always say, you know, kill the job you're in. But you have to take that job and do it better than they expect. And if you do it better than they expect, they want to give you more responsibility and try something new. And so you, you overwork that job to get to the next. And then you have to be really lucky and timing has to be right. And you have to have the right people around you kind of advocating for you. Uh, my transition from the field into the corporate office really was because I had a great mentor in Tom Blue who happened to be the guy that went and watched me do one of my pitches at a national account. And my, my boss was actually out with a back injury. So Tom was standing in, but then he had the influence to help bring me into the corporate office and really kind of take that career and move a lot forward. Uh, as far as things I would have done or done differently, uh, like I'm so happy in the work I'm doing right now. I really, I feel very, very fortunate to do it. The only thing in my career that I would have liked to do more of would be product management. I love the problem solving aspect, talking to users, finding out what the problems are. So if I had a chance to go back, I'd add that, but I still think I'd land where I am now. At least I hope so. Right, if I did it right, maybe? <laughs> yeah. So, John, how do you feel about networking, and how has it helped you build your company and get you ahead in the industry that you pursue? When my parents sent me to college, it was this idea of get good grades, do it right, do it well, and everything else will come. And in the profession that I chose in business, in sales and marketing, you have to be good at what you do. That's like the price of admission. But those who really excel have this network, this connection. They know other people, and they understand how to get things done within the company or the other companies, and it has to do with the people. So the thing that I learned uh, as far as networking goes is just be curious, ask a lot of good questions, find out what they like, what they need, understand not only on a personal side, but also on a professional side how you can work to do things on their behalf. When you do that, they want to do things for you. And so there's this cool model where you, you give and you get, and it kind of it works well without having it feel like uh, you're, you're trading for nasty favors or things that you don't really want to do. So as I got further into my career, I got much better at just reaching up the phone and reaching out the phone and asking and talking to somebody about, hey, I saw you on this video, or I heard you on this podcast, or I watched you in this show, and I want to know more about what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. Do you mind? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? And even though you don't, don't drink coffee, go to a coffee shop and just sit and hang out and get a <laughs> bottle of water. And you'd be amazed at the conversations you have when you get outside of just that corporate space and you just sit down on a couch and talk. Good things happen. Wow. So speaking a little bit about college, um, during an interview with the journal Sentinel, you spoke about how the textbook turns into real life after graduation. Would you say that your journey after graduation was by the textbook? Uh, no. The textbook is fascinating because it has this chapter plan where you're going to go this, then this, then this. And my journey really, I think I skipped a couple chapters, and then I had to go back and work forward. So it wasn't that. It's just a linear path. Uh, the thing I like about when we're talking about General Sentinel was all about you need the tactical, you need the relevant, I've done it, I've tried it, I've created it. There's too much theory in a lot of the textbooks. It's not in a practical application. And so when you think about your, your path, when you read it in the book, try to apply it. If you can't apply it, maybe it's not the right thing. All right, I'll keep that Makes in mind. Sense. Yeah. In 2014, you spoke at UW Madison on the topic of disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. Can you explain this a little bit further? And how have you seen disruptive innovation um, improve Milwaukee Tool since you started? When I first started the company, the organization really was more of an inside out. We were going to design it, and create it, and people would buy it. And as the new leadership came in, and Steve Richmond is by far one of the best I've seen in the industry, is really kind of helping an organization make great change. And he really brought in this idea, um, I believe it was uh, Clayton Christensen, that really kind of coined the phrase and really the theory on disruptive innovation. We've seen it multiple times. Uh, auto industry is probably the easiest to example. 
If you think about what Ford and General Motors had, they had a relatively expensive piece of technology in a vehicle that not everybody could afford. So when the Japanese came in and brought in Toyota, you took this technology, this vehicle, and made it affordable to more people, and you disrupted this market. After another couple decades, the Koreans came in with the Kia, and they did the exact same thing. And so the industry has been kind of disrupted multiple times on the auto side. We're doing something similar on the power tool side where all of these manual applications where you're seeing drywall and electricians have all these shoulder surgeries because they're working too high above their heads with heavy, heavy tools or repetitive motion where the screwdriver, you're manually twisting your wrist too many times. So we're coming in and putting a trigger and a motor and some technology behind that. And you were actually seeing healthcare costs go down. We're seeing companies be more profitable and people be happier and get home safer every night. And we're taking industries where they haven't done anything for 30 or 40 years. They've just kind of rested on this, well, we're the only one in the space. And all of a sudden we come in and we shake everything up and we change the paradigm of what's possible in that space. And we can typically do that for a lower price point. So we disrupt that model and we take this product that used to be $4,000. We're now doing it for less than $1,000 and we can sell more and have more people have access to it. So have your customers have your company? Absolutely. And the happier they are, the more they're likely they are to buy and tell everybody else about that product. It's still word of mouth. Marketing is a lot of glitz and glam, but word of mouth is by far the most effective thing. Very true. <laughs> My next question for you is, did you have major competitors when you started? How did you plan to compete with them and how did that plan play out for you? So Milwaukee, when I first started, we were a relatively small company. And the companies that were like Stanley and Black & Decker, uh, Bosch, Skill, really had a massive amount of market share. And so the different thing that we had is, is the underdog. I mean, like, why not us? Like, you hear about those Cinderella stories about those, like a Gonzaga that nobody knew about and then runs through this NCAA tournament. Like, wait, this is a tiny little school. They're not supposed to be able to beat the Kentuckys, the Kansas of the world. It's that same concept of if you put some really talented people together, you have a smart design for products that solve a true need, you can go in and disrupt this market and you can take share away. So our competitors have changed over the years that we've grown. We're fighting more fights than we did when we first started. And I think it was a belief that we could and the value we provide to the customers by bringing something out that no one's done before. Hmm. And it really helps when you bring lithium ion to the market first and you have all the patents <laughs> and sure. lawyers help you with those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So being first to market is a huge competitive advantage, especially when you disrupt the whole cordless market. Um, so could you explain your job title as VP of training and recruiting? Like, what does your job look like on a day-to-day -day basis? I tell stories for a living. At least that's what my kids think I do. <laughs> and uh, I make a ton of PowerPoints. But in my mind, it is I have these wonderful, capable people as part of the organization that are trying to figure out what they want to be when they grow up and how they can have an impact. And so my job is to build a program that allows them to learn while they're doing it, to be really successful while they're doing it, and be able to give more than they thought they could to the organization. I only can do that on the training side if we've recruited the right people into the, the group. So in the book, Good to Great, they talk about putting the right people on the bus. You get the people right first, everything else will follow. Firm believer and you've got to have the right people with you. So the culture fit, the capabilities, the aptitude, the drive, the motivation, the kind of how we breathe and live as an organization, the people that are coming into that have to be part of that and have to fit that. If they don't, they're not going to like the training programs I put in place because it's not what they want to do. So as a whole, I travel the country. I spend time with people. I try to help them be better than they currently are, change their behavior so they generate more revenue to give themselves more opportunities. That's awesome. So you help your employees and then they help you in the future? Yeah, because if they continue to do better, that means that I, my job is, is safe. So yeah. if I have people that are worse than when I touched them last, then I don't keep my job. <laughs> What was your time like as a cluster facilitator with leadership, and how did you get connected with leadership? Uh, leadership was one of my favorite weeks of all time. And if you think about leadership, everybody's written books about it, and everybody's read books about it. But until you actually try to practice it and get into it, I don't know how else. Leadership so is one of those. Done. Oh, absolutely. Reading it and then doing it, it's that whole textbook analogy as well. Like yeah. If you've read it, it doesn't mean you know what it is. And when we ask you in those tough moments where it's nothing's going right and you've got to stand against the tide and you've got to say that's the way forward and no one likes it and no one wants to be a part of it, but you know in your heart that that's where it's got to go, mm -hmm. that's how you lead in that moment and get there. Leadership was a great activity to really just experience a lot of that for a week. 
Uh, and I got hooked up because I had a great relationship with the Business Career Center at uh, UW-Madison. And the team that actually runs that week is actually headquartered out of that group. And so over demonstrating a couple of years of effective communication and presentations and just getting to know that network, they offered me the opportunity. And if anyone has a chance either to go to Leadership or be a facilitator at it, you absolutely have to. It will change your world. Sounds like a very cool experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to do it. Got to do it. So how did your degree in economics, how is your degree in economics useful in your work? Um, if you could go back, would you choose the same major? Why or why not? Yeah, the whole going back and choosing something different, I don't know. I mean, I think the mistakes I made are part of the reason why I am who I am right now. And I like me, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, economics really is that it's a broad picture. You think about I don't like the microeconomics. I like the macro. So how does a tax change here impact the overall trade? How do we take a look at some tariffs and barriers in this country that will then preclude us from being able to sell into that market? Uh, For example, when the Olympics were going on and the World Cup was going into Brazil, we're like, hey, we should really think about going into that market. We would like to take advantage of those masses. You know, there's going to be a lot of construction. We'd like to be a part of it. Well, there's a tariff in Brazil that if you don't manufacture there, it's 50% adder on your products. So you're instantly priced out of the market. Well, then does it make sense to financially to invest in and tool up a full facility in that country just so you can sell for the short-term period? And so I love that problem solving. How does it all fit together? What are the puzzle pieces? How does the money work? Because if you don't understand where the financing is coming from on a macro perspective, it's really tough to build anything. I mean, I got a lot of great yeah, ideas, but I can't fund <laughs> half of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so as of right now, you're the vice president of training and recruiting. Um, do you see yourself continuing to move up the ladder at Milwaukee Tool, or are you content with where you're at? Uh, I don't think anybody at Milwaukee is ever content. I mean, that's part of our culture is that we are always improving. We talk about continuous improvement, and we live it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my job has evolved. And I think if you look just at a title perspective, I don't know if it's going to change very much from that perspective. But from what my responsibilities are and how big the team is and the, the influence we're having, I expect that to grow. And if I didn't, I'm the wrong guy for the job. They should find somebody else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, thank you for answering all of our questions. We will now be moving on to our next segment, which is Flip It. So you will be Excellent. asking us the questions. Yep, and I prepared for weeks on this, as you can oh, see by all my great. notes. So we're <laughs> ready. Yeah. yeah. Now, so the question I have really more, um, trying to start with you, is when you think about what your future looks like, how much risk do you want to take? Talk to me a little bit about how far do you want to move away, how kind of outside the box of what you're your family, your friends, your experience has been, do you want to try to push that envelope? Um, it's a little hard to say as of right now. I want to take risks in life, but like sometimes it's a little nerve-wracking trying to decide how far you want to go with that. Like if I had to go across the country to like get a job, I would do that just if I know if I knew that would benefit me later in life. Okay. It'd be hard like being away from family, but if it's going to help me that much in the long run, I feel like you have to take it if it's going to outweigh the risks that you okay. have to take. Very good. So, Jenna, when you think about your future, mm-hmm. is it clear to you right now? Do you have any idea what you want to do? Um, well, my original plan was to um, major in um, business administration and psychology and then open my own chain of crisis centers. Okay. So that was my original plan, but I'm not sure. I mean, when you say original plan, has it already evolved? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I want it to be bigger than that. I don't know if I want to double major in communications, too, or, like, uh, I'm not sure. So how are you going to find out? Uh, I mean, college, but that is a pretty expensive way to find out. Yeah, oh, yes. but, there's, but you do, you learn a ton in that space, right? If you, especially if you have a sense of where you want from the mm-hmm. psychology and business tying it together. Mm-hmm. Have you thought about internships? Have you thought about, have you done any kind of volunteering yet in that space? Um, I have done um, quite a bit volunteering because I am president of my future business leaders of America. Great. Um, and I'm also doing, you know, biz tank. So I'm building my network to hopefully get an internship when I'm in college or even now so I can eventually fa- figure out where my path goes. Very nice. Well, good luck. Thank you. You'll figure it out. Yeah. So Katie, when you think about leadership and mentorship do you already are you in a position right now where you know kind of what that looks and feels like or how do you plan on understanding better about yourself for the whole how leadership works 
Um, definitely just, like, need to, like, learn about it more and, like, definitely the mentor part of it. Like, when you started talking about that earlier, I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for sure. But, yeah, I don't really know totally what I want to do or where I want to go, but I have ideas. And until you try them, you won't know. Yeah. I mean, that's the trick. I think, you know, Trent, to your point about risk, like how far are you willing to go? Uh, it's really, we've seen a big shift because it used to be when I was coming out, it was about how do you find the company? And now it seems to be a lot more, like we hire a lot of people and it's about what city do they want to live in? Or like kind of what kind of, how many seasons do they want to have? And do they want what kind of culture or nightlife? And people are like, I'm moving to Austin, Texas. <laughs> Austin's weird. I want to be a part of that. As opposed to, I'll go where the industry takes me. So talk to me for a second about if, like, if you had to choose anywhere in the country, where would you live? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, I love like living in Wisconsin, like the Midwest. I love the seasons, everything. But if there was like a job that took me to like California, Florida, <laughs> Texas, I'd be fine with that. I mean, it would be rough and a culture shock. But sure. I feel like. I could adjust to it if I needed to, being if there's a job lined up for me there and an opportunity waiting for me, I feel okay. like I could adjust to it pretty good. How about Katie Jenna? You think about leaving the state? Definitely. I mean, like, opportunities come up and... Got to take them. Yeah. Okay. I mean, with me, I'd like to stay as close to my family as I could. Yeah. So all my family lives in Wisconsin. Yep. <laughs> but, I mean, in the long run, if a job takes me somewhere, then... I mean, if it's an opportunity I can't refuse, then I'll go. We've been watching, and the state of Wisconsin has done a lot of work on trying to keep all of the mental and just intellectual property and the talent in this state because there's some really smart, capable people, and we're worried about that kind of that brain drain outside of the state. And my response to that is go so you can come back because the things that you love about growing up here and that network, they're powerful to actually bring those back and to be able to just have that wonderful experience. So it's a lot easier to go now. Like I have three, you know, two kids and a wife and a house, and it's a lot harder to move those things yeah. than it is to take the two suitcases that you can fit all of your stuff into right now and go. I definitely feel like I would want to go, but then, like, come back to, like, start a family, just like the area around here. Yeah. How about international? How, com how comfortable would you be actually leaving the United States and trying something else? I mean, like, I want to travel, but... I don't know for how long, like, if I would want to, like, stay there and do a job or something. Okay. Trent, so you're kind of shaking uh, your head, kind of that. It'd be pretty tough. I mean, I could maybe go for <laughs> one to three years at a max, okay. depending on where it is. Like, if it was, like, Europe, maybe, depending on the country, I could see myself taking, like, an opportunity there. If okay. it's worth, like, the risks of it. But... It would be pretty tough trying sure. to go, but sure. if I need to do that, then I need to do that. Um, I've only been on a plane once in my life, so I'm pretty comfortable in the United States, but that's where I'd like to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so what I will tell you is that we've had some people that we've moved in our organization, and uh, one of the people I rec recruited out of Madison, we ended up putting her out of Miami and then eventually out of the Caribbean. So she's now responsible for selling throughout the different islands that are there. And she spoke Spanish and loves it and now has no intent of coming back. <laughs> so fascinating how it can change. And the ability and willingness to take risk, early in your career, you can't make that many mistakes. There's not that many zeros behind your decisions. There's not that many people following those, work, those decisions you're making. So you can make some really cool risk-taking adventure pieces. And then if they don't work out, you've all got you know, ways to come back. Mm -hmm. My mistakes right now will, will cost somebody their job, me or somebody else, so I pay attention to those. But in, at this point in my career, they should, right? The, I only should be making decisions that are large. There are teams that can make the smaller day-to-day -day decisions. So I would encourage each one of you to think a little bit about how far you're going to stretch because I think if you are concerned about a long-term success or the future, you've got to try some things rather than know what you're capable of. And until you push, you won't ever know. All right, so now, favorite, favorite activity... Away from school and home. Katie, go start. All right. Um, this might sound kind of weird, but I'm in this dance type, uh, this type of dance called clogging. Nice. 
And yeah, I do it every like Sunday. We have practice. Okay. And I've become like an instructor in training, so I kind of like help and teach the younger kids. Fantastic. So you're already, you're already knowing leadership. I mean, you're demonstrating it already. Oh yeah. For Very sure. good. Trent, what about you? Uh, I gotta say sports. Okay. What kind of sports? Um, baseball, football. Just being there with your teammates, trying to like accomplish one thing together, like your chemistry, because yes. you can't. Unless it's like an individual sport, you can't go anywhere without your team. So you got to build that chemistry and all work together. Absolutely. And just building moments and memories with them. It's the best thing. Nice. Um, I got to say sports too. Okay. <laughs> so I, I'll go um, tennis because I play both singles and doubles. Nice. And doubles, again, it's like that team you have to build together and accomplish together. But um, when I play singles, it's all about improving me Um into you know like success sure so the cool thing about the activities you're in right now the things you're learning right now you won't even realize how big of an impact they're going to have on your careers because of the pushing yourself to get better in the things that you want to do individually understanding how the team ties together and you can't work without them not only learning and practicing but then competing and i think we forget sometimes that as we learn these things in a sports field we expect to practice 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 and then deliver but then we go to the business world and we expect to just show up and know it there's no practice. I just, here I am in business. I want this. So I think you've got to think about the things that you're learning right now in practice and in teamwork and in, you know, kind of individual need to succeed. Those things will take you so far in how you'll actually make the steps and the leaps that you want into your careers. So I'm, I'm a huge, we hire a ton of sports athletes, partly because they get the concept of work. They really understand what it takes to, to get sweaty, to get dirty, to go after it and want something and actually fight for it. Biggest fear? Trent, you're starting. Oh, that is a tough one. Um, probably losing those closest around me. Sure. Because, I don't know. I love being with family, friends. And then if one day, like, they just weren't there, it's tough. Absolutely. It's hard. I hope that doesn't happen for many years. I hope so, too. All right. And for all of you guys. Oh, my God. Yeah, a family, because, you know, they're they're the reason why I am who I am today, you know. Yeah, I don't absolutely. know what to do without them, you know. Cool connections. You can feel it. All right. I'd have to say, like, not being good enough, like, for, like, certain things, whether it's, like, a job or, like, opportunities, like, anything, basically, I guess. The cool thing about that fear is it'll drive you to succeed. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about do you want to win or do you hate to lose? And it's the idea of the people that hate to lose, I would choose every day of the week. Because they have this just inherent need and this drive to succeed and just they'll win. Because they can't stand the idea of going home without the hardware or without the high five from the teammates and just kind of that connection. And the cool thing about what you two are talking about as far as family goes the teams that you create and the networks you establish will last forever because you'll treat them like family and you'll make that connection. And the work world will have a family built into it. You'll spend a lot of time with those people. When I'm at the office for more than a couple hours a day, it's about the people I'm around. And if the company I was at didn't have good people, product isn't enough to keep me there. It's the people that make you want to go back and fight for and go beat the competition because you know how much of an impact it'll have on the people that are around you. So those fears that you have are a good thing, right? So keep stretching them, keep pushing them, and keep pushing on for to have more of that success. All right. Well, uh, John, thank you so much for everything that you've given us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you're welcome. You. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks for joining us in the studio. Yeah, I Appreciate absolutely. it. That flip thing was pretty cool. Nice work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not putting too much pressure on us. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll you be wonderful. The opportunities you're taking right now are going to make such a difference, right? So just keep pushing, keep fighting, and tell everybody else about it, right? Word of mouth works. Networking works. Share what you've learned. We will. Yeah. We'll do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Once again, a huge thank you to John Finch, who has been with us in studio on Kids in the Tank. Before we continue with our last segment, The Roundtable, here's a word from our sponsors. Because, I mean, we can't really pay for this ourselves, can we? We wouldn't Definitely be here without not. Them. No. <laughs> 
Prestige Paints is changing the way you buy paint. We're the number one selling brand of interior and exterior paint on Amazon.com. And with the help of our app, Prestige Color Pick, we're making paint buying a whole lot easier. With the app, you can take a picture of your wall and then virtually paint it with any of our 2,400 plus colors. And now you can try our competitors' colors on your walls too. Once you find the color you love, you can purchase it from Amazon right through the app, saving yourself a trip to the store. Prestige Color Pick is free and available through the App Store and Google Play. Live colorfully and design your life with Prestige. Hi, this is Mike Butler with Elkhorn Chemical and Packaging. We've been in business for 65 years. We're located in Wisconsin. We represent the janitorial, packaging, safety, and maintenance categories. We sell to small businesses all the way to large corporations. So, if you're in need of a cleanup in aisle 9, give us a call at 800-377-3556 or check us out at elkhornchemical.com. Welcome back to Kids in the Tank. We are now entering our third and final segment, The Roundtable, where we will be discussing today's hot topics and trends. And we're actually going to be bringing in Troy to the round table because many of us wonder what's going through his head. Sometimes I honestly don't even know myself, so it's going to be quite Not the do. spectacle. <laughs> so um, can we just start by talking about O.J. Simpson being OJ. released? Oh, O.J. Okay, so <laughs> O.J. thought he could get away with murder, and he did, technically. Um, but that's kind of where you should stop in the realm of trying to get away with all that stuff. Because do you guys do you guys know what happened with him at all? Um, yeah, but I think that you should explain it. To <laughs> okay, so um, from my knowledge, from what little I know about stuff, um, O.J. Simpson was uh, put in jail for uh, robbery of his own memorabilia that somebody took from him, so he's trying to steal it back. And uh, he, like I said, I feel like he just kind of got caught up in the "I'm invincible" and just kind of being kinda a football overboard. player. Yeah, yeah kind of went overboard. Of his time. <laughs> so, how do you guys feel about that? I mean, a little harsh, but. A little harsh. I mean, it was his stuff. You shouldn't have stolen it in the first place. But OJ, come on. Like, you really, you really think you could have got away be with that? Smarter about now. it, though. <laughs> like anything. If OJ Simpson comes up in a police report, they're gonna do everything they can to be like, okay, he's probably guilty this time. So he probably he got that <laughs> one. Time. He got that free yeah. card. Yeah. <laughs> Second time's the charm. It's okay. Speaking of which, I just got a uh, new iPhone, <laughs> and uh, I am depressed to think about how much it actually costed me because it was super expensive. The and iPhone 7? The iPhone 7, and well, I'm not even on that iPhone 8 I've yet. heard the iPhone 8 supposed to come out at over $1,000. That's so. ridiculous. Ooh, that's next Guess who's not going to get that phone? <laughs> that's like... All oh, of us. All of us, yeah. You could, that's <laughs> like the same as a computer almost. Like a nice high-end computer you could that you definitely use, use for as a Mac, yeah. yeah. I, oh, that's is ridiculous. Like full glass, like front and back. Yeah, it's like this entire marketing. There's scheme. no like buttons. It's just like, gonna so it's just a like touch. Of yeah, there's no buttons at all. Nice for be, volume or anything. It's just gonna be made to break. They're just gonna yeah. make all their money from like, oh, I need a new, new one, new, right. new screen. And now there's gonna be that. new cases that are gonna help them, but then it just breaks them even more. So they always say that, but it never really works. All right, exactly. Yeah. So. Guess who's switching to Samsung, guys? No. <laughs> yeah, nah. no. Probably, probably I can't not get rid of my iPhone. IPhone. Sorry, no. Android. I love it. The emojis are too weird. I don't oh, like yeah. yeah. Yeah, the camera call. I can't deal with that. I can't take my selfies with the Android camera, dog. All right. So, um, <laughs> have you guys heard about uh, Jared Kushner? Jared who now? Kushner. Jared, Jared Kushner? Uh, Donald Trump's son? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, all right. Did, did a little dirt on the down low with Russia and, you know, basically all of Trump's administration, but I don't know if we're going to talk about that. But, I mean... <laughs> I'm glad somebody finally got caught. That is true. <laughs> I mean, it's been going a while. It's been going along. It's been going on for like a little bit now, and like so much talk, but nothing's ever proven. Oh yeah, no, nothing's ever proven. It's just speculations, and finally, something concrete has been done and said. So, do you want to explain it a little bit to people who are listening? So, for the people who are listening to this, uh, Jerry Kushner, Donald Trump's son, um, had was proven to have ties with Russia, and I'm sure most of you understand with media and social media know that Russia and Trump kind of been like put thrown in the same like box I guess like being in ties during the election uh Vladimir Putin helping him rig the election or whatever but since that's all going on something finally came above ground with Jared Kushner and how he has ties to like Russia itself and the Russian government so I don't know what's going to like prosper from that but on a little bit of a lighter note, you guys see that Beyonce wax? It was Ready? terrible. Beyonce? It doesn't. It didn't look anything like her. How like, gonna be my girl Beyonce like that, man? The, Dude, the really color good of her really skin bad. just. 
Okay, we I all mean, know. Okay. Yonsei, Yonsei's black. All right, Yonsei's black. Don't and make And they her made her look white. white. Don't make, don't, it's like the Kardashians trying to be black. Exactly. Like, the, just the features on her face, too. They fixed it, and it looks a little better, but... Oh, it did not look good. I haven't seen the updated yeah. version. Of it. If I, I was, haven't either. If I was my girl Bay, I would have that person fired because I would be so hurt and disrespected. <laughs> I'm like, you really think I look like that? I'm sure it was it a really? ton of people's work, but it just mm. didn't turn out very well. Yeah, yeah, the entire internet just like went into an uproar. It was ridiculous. Oh yeah, I'm pr- I think I think the same person did like three other wax figures of like singers and like celebrities and stuff like that that were also pretty trash but mm. I don't I can't remember who but I know Kylie Jenner had one that looked really really Yeah, similar. it looked pretty scary similar. You couldn't tell them apart. Like they took a selfie and like like almost like they took I couldn't a poll. tell which one was I really which. couldn't tell which one was which. <laughs> it was I mean, pretty considering scary. Ki- <laughs> fake anyways. So. Yeah, considering Kylie Jenner's half plastic anyways. Yeah. Oh. It's kind of easy it's kind of easy to <laughs> this generation's Michael Jackson. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, except Michael Jackson was talented. Though. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> speaking of singers and celebrities, um, I don't know how much you guys follow, you know, French uh, pop culture and like music and whatnot, but there's a story that recently rose that a French singer actually died on stage oh, yeah. while performing. Yeah. Got electrocuted That's tragic. by that her microphone. That is insane. She she got electrocuted by her microphone Yeah, yeah because stage. there were storms like in the area and then lightning struck and it went up. I, I don't can know. only imagine like all the people watching. Right. Oh seeing gosh. like who you're watching just drop in front of you. <laughs> yeah. Die. Like, That's so scary. Oh my God. And Nobody she was like a new artist on. too. Her so much potential. first album just came out too and it was just you know, talk it's about tragic. Talk about bad luck, man. Like, can that you imagine? That is awful. Oh my gosh. All right. So speaking of bad luck, mom jeans. Mom jeans. And mom jeans. I'm. I'm just gonna say, mom jeans aren't really for me. Yeah, I mean, mom yeah. jeans. Really? Should, I couldn't. Mom I think jeans should be left to the moms to wear because I feel like they moms. rock it better. I think you guys could really pull them off. You I don't know. So? I actually got them for you guys. So. Oh, you, okay. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So after this, we're gonna, we're gonna try yeah. these on. We're gonna do a little fashion show, and you guys see how we look. No. <laughs> Yeah, but mom jeans, they have their own section. They're like boyfriend jeans and girlfriend jeans, but now there's mom jeans, and I'm not sure how I feel about it. One of the dad it. jeans coming out. True. Ooh, They're going to come out with those dad jeans with a little, that's little next belt season. loop on the side. Yeah. <laughs> what, what happened to just pants? Like, can I go in a store and, like, hey, I want a pair of pants. Can I just do that? Like, why, no. what happened to that? What kind of pants? What rise? What destruction? What wash? Oh, what kind of pants? It doesn't work like that anymore. Want? It's completely different. Yeah. I guess so, I guess so. But, I mean, being in high school, you know, uh, all this fashion, mom jeans, dad hats, and, like, both hats, all this stuff that, <laughs> all this stuff that passed and gone that is going to come up. High school is changing, whether we like it or not, and we're all changing. One of the things that high school is talking about changing is sexual education convos. Now, if you're discretion advised, you might be talking about some stuff that maybe is uncomfortable for some people, so just, if you Very don't like opinionated. it, a couple of years. <laughs> um, so... They're talking about expanding conversations in sex ed, and I think I believe what they're talking about is educating those who consider to be transgender or part of the LGBTQA plus community. And I feel like that's a really good idea, to be honest with you guys. What do you guys think? Right, I agree completely because they should know how to be safe and what. Even if of- you don't agree with it, you should still like know about it and. Be aware exactly. of what yeah. everyone else is thinking exactly. is going on this in their lives. This is a lives. generation of acceptance, so I think that generation we should definitely... Generation of change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I yeah. mean, like, what's what's stopping us? Like, why should we be educated in that and then they not be educated in that? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, right. there, sh- there shouldn't be any disparity between that. They're still people. They still deserve to be educated in everything that we be should be educated into. Speaking of education, memes are dying, and <sighs> that's something that should be brought to all of our attention yeah. Because this has affected us. Greatly. Yeah. So harshly. Ca- I, I, every month I'm more in the passing of the past meme, but I think this month is the dancing hot dog on Snapchat. Oh, yeah. He's it's pretty funny. One. I mean, <laughs> it's funny, out but of... it gets, after yeah. a while, it just gets too much. Like, yeah. the first the first week of him just, like, dancing, doing that little hand spin, is like, oh, right. awesome, but then afterwards it kind of just dies. used to be, like, one meme, meme, like, every week. Now it's, like, one meme a month. Yeah. And then by the end of the month, you're just like, Get yeah, yeah. it's, it's like, sick. Oh, okay. no one like, wants to see that going. anymore. Right, it's favorite so boring. Favorite meme, it's so old. Do you guys have a favorite meme? Uh, well, what's yours? <laughs> my One of my favorite memes is, honestly, like, the, the evil Kermit. Uh, you guys <laughs> oh, yeah. This would be, this yeah. be on social media. I don't know what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, that's a good one. Though. Uh, like, the little Kermit with a little black hat, the hood in the background. I really like... <laughs> okay, so I'm very immature, and I think mocking <laughs> is still funny, which is bad. 
Uh, but I think the whole squid, uh, Squidward, SpongeBob mocking. Oh, I love the, that yeah. one. Oh, okay. Kind of thing. I thought that was hilarious, and I still kind of think it is. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it, but that's my favorite one. Yeah, that's I gotta say yeah. that's one of my favorites. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, on the topic of dying, let's flip the script and talk about saving something. Okay. Now, my main dude, my main guy, Chance the Rapper, Chance the Bennett, has saved SoundCloud people. Do you want to explain how he did that? Um, I believe SoundCloud. I mean, there's a rumor. I don't know how true it is that SoundCloud was broke. But there's a rumor on Twitter that SoundCloud didn't have enough money to fund itself anymore. And for those of you who don't know, SoundCloud is this platform for uh, new art, new up-and-coming artists that want to get their songs out there, whether it be rap, hip-hop, beats, or any type of music that you want to listen to. And people can literally create a free account, upload any music they want, and become discovered. It's one of the ways Chance the Rapper got discovered, to be honest with you, which is why I think he has such a strong opinion on this. It turned out pretty well for him. Yes, right, yes, yeah, it did. Yeah. Just a little yes, bit, it, I just, mean. Just, not that a little much, bit. but... A little bit of fame. Wait, who's Chance the Rapper? Oh. I'm just kidding. My heart. <laughs> Better be. That heart. commercial is so annoying, though. The Kit Kat one? Yeah. Oh my God. Baby, I'm not gonna do it. Um, <laughs> speaking, <laughs> speaking of uh, artists and stuff, I'd like to take a moment of silence for the late, the great Chester Bennington. He uh, passed away this couple, within this past week or two of uh, suicide, and it's something that is extremely sad. Do you guys know what band he's from? Yes. Lincoln Park. Lincoln. Lincoln Park. When I went through my little emo phase in middle school, and I used to like, uh, no, I still like Lincoln <laughs> like, Park. Every, yeah. Everyone liked them though, like because they were yeah. so widespread. Like, yeah, they, they were... didn't have one genre of music. It was exactly. like everything. They were so good. It was, it was like the first band that I heard like kind of do like rock and then rap. So I was like, okay, mm. okay, Lincoln, I feel you. But like going on his death, like there's speculation it was murder, like that was posed as a suicide. That's crazy. Right. I didn't hear about but that. But I honestly, I think that it was a suicide because he set his family up to have like their lives just set up for them oh yeah like he bought them a new house like two days or something before he he was committed like, suicide so he was ready and he not ready but like he knew what was coming he yeah. did what he I did guess. Mm-hmm. no one else could really stop him yeah it's it's so hard to talk about depression mm. and what happens afterwards right i mean if you guys are ever going through this make sure that you get help please yes. anybody yeah. there is a hotline please talk to somebody if you have my number Hit me up and we can talk about things, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On a lighter note, though, I look at how we dress. We all look pretty good, pretty good. But what if, uh, <laughs> what if our schools? I know we didn't really have a school dress. Code. I don't know about Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're from Dalvin, but I don't. Re- I know we really didn't have a strong, structured dress code where we had to wear uniforms. How do you guys feel about schools incorporating that now? Mm-hmm. I feel like it would be really different, like especially for high schools mm-hmm. where they're like, yeah. oh express yourself and then if they like change to that yeah right yeah. make everybody the same based like the military or like yeah. prison does right. you know it kind of strips everybody their like, identity we're gonna be out on our own in like four years after we start high mm-hmm. school like we should be able to determine how we dress yeah. restrictions is one thing but like making everyone be the same mm-hmm. That's then that kind of defeats the whole purpose of like being unique and mm-hmm. being special in your own right. way exactly, exactly. Jinx. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um high school in general was a lot of fun for me i'm a recent uh, high school graduate and one of the things I really miss is actually playing high school football and I've recently heard a lot of buzz about CTE in the football world and do you guys know what CTE is? I think do you know what that is? It's like head trauma that's especially like prominent caused football by, players. Yeah, isn't but it like, caused by concussions, concussions or something yeah, like that? Yeah, but you can't identify it until after someone has passed away. Really? Like, yeah. I didn't know that. When you're alive you can't diagnose it because you can't go inside someone's brain like in that aspect. Yeah. So are they trying to figure, insane. like, out a way to do that? Yeah, they're trying to figure out new technology to, like, try and help people. But it's never going to go away completely. It's the game of football. You can always right, yeah. decrease the chances. You can get concussions in like, tons football. of different ways. You can yes. walk down like, the steps of your house fall, and fall concussion. and get a concussion. I don't know yeah. who in the world would ever do that and would miss a football game <laughs> for it, so... It's okay. <coughs> Some people fall into a wall and then have to miss like three games of basketball. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On another side of sports, <laughs> you guys hear about basketball. my boy Kyrie. <laughs> Kyrie, you traitor, man. Uh, First snake. KD, now you leave. <laughs> you leaving the land, man. All right, that's that's fine. It's, I respect your decision. He, he's still super rich. I no love Kyrie, but <laughs> I didn't like the decision. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, I mean, the, the Cavaliers is, are gonna be LeBron anyways, no yeah. matter what. So well, the whole point of sports, though, win championships, being a championship three straight years. And, and then, then just leave. leave. <laughs> like when it started to get good. I think leave. John Wall said something about him like three championship or like three 
finals appearances, but you don't want that. You want to be your own player. That's that's yeah. kind of selfish, to be honest with you. Right, you got to think about the team. Exactly, exactly, exactly. There's right. no I in team. There is no a win. There is no <laughs> win. There is yeah. an I in win. Think about that. <laughs> True. <laughs> but uh, talking about leaving and like kind of giving up on stuff, uh, Sean Spicer actually resigned. Do you, uh, I think what? it was like the, oh, what was it, the... The head of like the press, the speaker of the press, or something like that. The United States for Donald Trump, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I think he just got tired of all, of all Trump's like midnight Twitter rants about stuff that he really doesn't <laughs> know what he's talking about. That would be a hard job to handle. Yeah, I think I'd just get online every day and just, oh, now I gotta fix this. Like <laughs> trying to figure wow. everything out, backtracking so much. Oh yeah, oh yeah, trying to like make sure he doesn't offend like everybody at one yeah. point. <laughs> um. So if we're gonna talk about new things we, we might as well talk about uh the unicorn frappuccino and now like matt black frappuccinos what's next matt now? black like, yeah i have not seen that i want to know what they're gonna make matt black taste like i think it's just gonna taste like <laughs> dirt and i don't regret. know if i want to try something that's just completely black though like a drink i feel like that just tastes weird like well, what's wrong no. with black? Like, i've seen like cups like, that are matt black though, starbucks like, black. no like, but is not, it the cup like, or is it like I haven't itself. seen the drink well, itself. Is drinking be just black. something pure black? Like, have, have you guys ever like, had ugh. black water? No. no. They sell no. it at Century and Walworth, and it's literally just a bottle, and it's water, but it's black. It tastes exactly the same. It's just, I, I, don't, don't, see, I don't know if I would do that. I'm going to tell you this. If you spend your money on black water, <laughs> <laughs> when you have a faucet at home, and you just want the color to change, you want to buy some food coloring and just do, do like, oh, red, tie-dye, no, whatever you want. Don't, yeah, don't it's like $4 water. for a bottle of black water. <laughs> it's like, why Makes are you spending that much? Absolutely no sense. Right. Absolutely no sense. But that is seems to be it for the uh, round table. Thank you guys very much for listening to Kids in the Tank. Make sure to tune in next week for our next guest, Nick Bowers, who is a performance analyst at Emirates Team New Zealand. You guys ready for this? Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A one. A two. A three. Tanked! <laughs> Bye, guys. To learn more about BizTank and this podcast, check out our website at genevasupply.com backslash BizTank or head over to our Facebook pages. Tonight's episode of Kids in the Tank was hosted by Jenna, Trent, and Katie with Roundtable special guest Troy, guest speaker John Finch, producers William Burdett, and Danny Butler. Content producer, Melissa DeBuck. Executive producer, Dave Polzine. Co-creator and director, Jeff Peterson. And co-creator, Mark Becker.